Hey, good morning, and welcome to our live stream. We're going to be talking a little bit about uh, sewing today, and we're going to be asking and answering questions. So feel free to come online and comment, and I will make sure to answer all of your questions, no matter how strange they are. But I do reserve the right to not answer and block creepy questions because nobody got time for that. So let me know when you get into the room and just comment and say hi and where you're from and post questions in there. I have a list of questions that I have collected uh, from a couple of different places when I asked for questions to answer on this live stream. So feel free to ask your questions away. Good morning, Barbara. It's good to see you online. Um, hello, Amaris, and uh, welcome. It looks like we are currently having nice-ish weather. Uh, this last Wednesday, it was sunny and 60, and I got a bit of a sunburn, and then on Friday, it was snowing, so yay, Oregon. <laughs> um, I hope it's warm for you down there in Georgia, Amaris, and uh, that you are getting lovely weather. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the uh, chat box below. So we will just go ahead and get started and folks can join us as they come online. So hello, my name is Althea Rizzo and I am here to talk all about sewing having courage to sew scary things, having ADHD, historical clothing, and pretty much anything clothing and sewing related. Uh, today we're hosting an Ask Me Anything. This is a sort of casual question and answer session. I have some questions that I've collected from a few sources, and you are frill, free, bleh, and you are free to put questions into the chat box and I will answer them as they come up. Um, good morning, Kathleen. It's always nice to see you. Yes, Amaris, it's always nice to have peace and quiet to do our sewing in. Um, I grew up in a family of a lot of children, so I certainly value my peace and quiet. I'm number nine of 10. <laughs> so I, I totally understand about uh, the need for peace and quiet. So, um, the first question I have here is what inspired me to start sewing and creating historical clothing? And, you know, I think that I have uh, always been interested in historical clothing. I, you know, first started reading some of my, the first books that I read were, um, Jane Austen and, and Emily Dickens and um, you know, books like Jane Eyre and um, all of the Austen books. So my, my early formative years in, in fiction were, were all historical fiction. And I just have always been intrigued by history. And so, you know, you really can't get more in tune with the historical past um, by putting on the clothing that they wore. And it, you know, when you're putting on something from the Victorian era and you're putting on the corsets and the layers and the petticoats and wearing a bustle or, you know, any of the clothes that they would have worn then, it really makes it easier to kind of slide into the skin of somebody who lived in the past. And you know, that's always kind of intrigued me is in school we learn about the big political um, histories, but we rarely touch on the people and who the people were, and especially people um, of color or women's stories or domestic stories. So there's, there's so much missing from our historical education. And by looking into clothing history, you know, you're getting about as intimate as possible with the the people from the past and so that's why I really love you know researching and making historical clothing um, I started sewing 
really, really young. I grew up on a farm, lots and lots of kids. So my mom would make clothes um, and then those clothes would be handed down. Uh, the kid right in front of me was a boy, so I wore a lot of boys' clothes work growing up. Um, but when you live on a farm, there's, there's really not a lot of hand-me-downs because things get worn out really quickly. So, you know, we learn to sew, we learn to mend, um, and I have really expensive tastes in clothing. I really like well-made clothing. I like, you know, the, the time it takes to do proper tailoring or putting in a lining or, you know, making sure my seams are mostly perfect. I don't try for perfect perfection because I know myself <laughs> and perfect perfection is just really not a thing for me. So I sew because I have, you know, uh, <laughs> I have really expensive tastes and that's the only way that I can afford, you know, super well-made clothes unless I find something vintage or used. So feel free to uh, pop questions into the chat and um, I'll keep going from this list that I have, unless somebody posts something. Um, so, next question is, what are some of the common mistakes beginners make when sewing historical garments and how can they avoid them? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, I think a common mistake is undervaluing your own skill, even as a beginner or thinking that you can't learn some of these more technical techniques when it comes to sewing. And that um, I think a common mistake is thinking that you have to get it perfect right away. And that's why you know, I encourage people to practice with uh, cheaper fabric before they cut into their expensive <laughs> fabric, because there's nothing more stressful. Even for me, someone who's been sewing you know, about 50 years now, um, cutting into that expensive fabric is still nerve wracking. And if it is a complicated garment or if the fabric is really expensive, um, I will probably have made one or two mock-ups. Um, I will have made lots of changes over those mock-ups so that when I do cut into the expensive fabric, um, I know that it, minor changes are all I'm going to need to do. Um, another common mistake, um, I think, is not taking your time. Um, we, we, you know, we live in a TikTok, we live in a TikTok culture these days, and, you know, we want instant gratification, and you kind of just have to throw out the whole concept of instant gratification when it comes to your sewing. If you want instant gratification, you go to Shein. Um, they can have something that's poorly made, but very cheap on your door within a few days. You're sewing because you want something that fits, that looks good, is high quality. And cutting corners, like not um, pressing your seams as you go, or not grading your seams. That's where you kind of cut off bits of the seam allowance uh, to reduce bulk. Um, other things are common mistakes are not making mock-ups and um, not taking your own measurements or the measurements of where it is that you're sewing for and then starting from there. So those are some of the common mistakes that I see, but they're all fixable mistakes. Um, you're not going to be perfect right away and that's okay. Uh, learning is part of the fun of sewing. Nobody springs, you know, from <laughs> the, the heads of gods and sews perfectly. I, and I still make bonehead mistakes every time I sew a project. Um, I still sew sleeves inside out. I still sew uh, things inside out. I sew things with the wrong side of the fabric. I pick the wrong pattern piece to sew to the other pattern piece. I mismeasure. So I still make a lot of mistakes, but we, we all learn from them and we just keep going because we want them to wear pretty things. So the next question I got was, how do you choose the right fabric for a historical garment? 
and what are some of the considerations to keep in mind. So sewing historically as accurately as possible um, means using a lot of, or exclusively, depending on which time period it is, um, natural fibers. And those tend to be more expensive. And one of the common things to think about is, um, you know, when you're choosing the right fabric, knowing um, was it, would it have been in linen or would it have been in silk or cotton or, or woolens? Um, looking at what the weave structure is. Is it a plain weave or a tabby weave or is the uh, weave structure more complicated? And we, depending on what time period you're, you're going for, um, there could be a lot of information out there on what historical fabrics they wore or used or made um, or some time period that's more difficult. Like my time period, the sixth fifth to sixth century Merovingian period, there's very little. There's, there's only a handful of extant garments um, and scraps of fabric spread out across Europe. So we don't have a lot to go on. And sometimes it's hard to find uh, the proper weave structure for Merovingian textiles. Good morning, Dusty. It's great to see you here. Um, we're just doing an Ask Me Anything. So feel free to pop non-creepy questions <laughs> into the comment section and we will answer them. Um, so when you're looking at doing uh, historical garments and you're choosing your fabrics, it can be really expensive. Um, you know, a good woolen in a historical weave, you know, can, can easily be 40, 50, 60 or, or higher. It, you know, it just depends on where you're purchasing from, how big the print run is, um, and, and a few other things. And there's no shame in when you're getting started to use blends or to, you know, use synthetic fabrics when you're just getting started. Um, because we want to make sure that you're learning those basic skills before you launch into, you know, some more um, aggressive projects or more advanced projects. So feel free to, you know, start out on the cheap and just do some practice runs before you uh, purchase and, and cut into that expenses. So Dusty asked, do you have any resources on fitting garments? Um, do you mean uh, refashioning um, clothing that you've you purchased so it fits better or for fitting garments as you uh, make them. So for um, resources for fitting garments, I highly recommend looking at vintage sewing books. You can find them in thrift stores and used bookstores. There's a lot of books out there in the vintage and used section on how to fit. And some of these books um, have really in-depth ways of diagnosing the problem. You know, if your fabric is bunching up here on the shoulder, some of those vintage books will tell you how to adjust the pattern, or if it's too tight through the bust, or if you have to do a full bust adjustment, um, if you have to lengthen things, you have to widen things. Some of those older vintage books, uh, those older vintage sewing books can be super helpful. And so that's what I recommend. Um, if you go to archive.org, that's A-R-C-H-I-V-E dot O-R-G, and type in um, dressmaking books, there's a whole bunch of free ones online that you can download or borrow for an hour. And that will be a great resource for diagnosing fit problems and then finding ways to solve them. Um, so secret method of secret pants. Um, I'm a big fan of the removable two button style. Um, that way, if you wanted to, you could completely remove the panels um, and, and just have pants. I'm also super uh, intrigued by what Nicole Rudolph is doing with her 
historically accurate Azarafel costume. Um, if you want to check out her videos, she's doing um, Azarafel's uh, uh, clothing, um, but historically accurate. Um, and she's she's doing secret pants and so check out her video i think that there's a lot of really interesting she's a lot of really interesting things that she's doing with that that outfit set okay so the next uh, question i got um, is can you walk us through the challenges of sewing historical garments and how do you overcome them? Ooh, that's a toughie. Um, so, because I don't know what time period, you know, we got all of all of history. <laughs> the further back you go, um, the simpler the garments are. However, we have less information about them. Uh, when you're getting into, you know, the mid, early to mid 1800s, we start having a lot of printed. Um, material on uh, how to sew, on uh, cutting and patterning garments. We have um, catalogs that people use to purchase fabric through, so we get a lot more information. So really, one of the first challenges of sewing a historical garment is, is choosing your time period and then doing research for what you know was worn, how it was worn, how was it constructed, um, and then once you do that, then launching into the making of the garment, and you know that starts with patterning or draping. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of different um, late 1800s, early 1900s um, patterning systems, for lack of a better word, and they're books that. Um, show you how to pattern a, a garment based on your measurements so you would take your measurements and this you it, they would say you know measure 48 inches this way and then take half of your chest measurement and measure this way and then you draw this curve from this point so there's a lot of these these pattern drafting systems available for the late Victorian um, early modern period so that makes it much easier to pattern the garment, but when we're looking at way earlier, we don't have those kinds of resources. So some of the challenges is just figuring out how those garments were put together and how they were sewn. Um, it's the, it's the, how do I overcome them? So how do I overcome some of that is, I just, I spend a lot of time researching, um, and I mentioned archive.org and I, I <laughs> I will continue to beat this drum for, for that website because they have a lot of really great resources there for free. I also spend a lot of time looking at museum costume collections, especially ones like the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, they oftentimes have very close in photographs of not just the outside of a garment, but sometimes the inside of the garment. So museum websites are another really good one to uh, start to look at. And I have um, a video on how to do research in museum collections online. And uh, I will try to remember to post that below. I'm just gonna make a note <laughs> so I don't forget that. Um, so those are great web, uh, places to start for doing research. Um, let's see, how, what advice do I want to give who is just starting out with historical clothing but doesn't know where to begin? Um, you know, there's, there's really no wrong place to start. Um, if you want to, you know, jump right in, you know, there's nothing wrong with purchasing a pattern. There's a number of pattern companies online that uh, sell patterns for reproductions. And I also have a video for how to find historical um, patterns, and I will put that into the um, description down below. There's a number of places like that, or you could dive right into the historical research and research the period you're doing, or you can just start to um, gain 
generalized sewing skills by sewing modern clothes, you know, sewing a t-shirt or learning how to sew a dress or make a pair of pants. Um, so, you know, where you start is up to you and how your brain works, how much time you have, um, how many, you know, how, how much sewing have you done in the past. It just, where to start is, is where you start. There's, there's really no wrong place to do that. Uh, the next question is, what advice, nope, 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 that was the one I just asked. <laughs> Sir. So how do you balance historical accuracy with modern functionality when creating historical garments? So that's a really good question. Um, I am a participant in the medieval recreation society called the uh, uh, Society, why am I blanking on that name? <laughs> the Society for Creative Anachronism, or the SCA. And the creative uh, aspect is very strong there. Um, while people strive for historical accuracy, um, you know, basically we say as long as it looks good at, at you know, 10 paces, you're, you're doing fine. And balancing historical accuracy with modern functionality is, is kind of that tightrope that we walk. I mean, we will never ever be able to recreate perfectly a historical garment because oftentimes um, we no longer raise the kind of sheep that the wool was made of, or we no longer use um, the dye processes that they would have used to dye woolens or silks or cottons or linens. Um, we no longer weave in the same way. There is some weaves from the Merovingian period that I simply have not been able to find um, in the Merovingian time and in the early early medieval time uh, there were what they called spin patterned tabbies where the spin of one yarn would be set against the spin of another so you could create patterns because the spin would be going this way and the spin would be going this way and you can make stripes and, and plaids out of that but I I have not found that fabric so you know that's kind of where I have to um, make compromise and um, just use other types of, of patterns in linen um, you know, I can get striped linens, I can get plaid linens that are created by weave. They're not exactly what they were in, in the Merovingian time, but they're good enough for what I need. So it just really comes down to, you know, what level of accuracy you're, you're aiming for and what level of modernity are you willing to accept. Um, you know, some people have access and functional needs. Um, where they would not be able to lace up a corset, so they hide a zipper in there, or buttons are difficult to navigate for them, and they can use snaps or hooks, um, and just the buttons could be a decorative piece. So it just really goes back to the individual. Um, next question is, some of, what are some of my favorite historical garments that I've created, and what makes them special to you? Oh, um... Let's see. So one of my favorite was a recreation of the Eleanor de Toledo dress from uh, that's in the Pitti Palace in in Italy in, in Florence, and that was special for me because it was like one of the first truly historically patterned um, garments that I made. Um, when I started in the SCA, you know, I, I was coming in um, with a lot of modern sewing, and so my early efforts were very, very modern. Um, it took me a while to give up, you know, velour velvet, because velour velvet is, like, super comfortable. <laughs> um, and so that dress was really my first uh, historically patterned. Um, garment. It didn't fit perfectly. I never really got it quite right. Um, but, you know, I was able to find an adequate brocade and adequate trim that I could use on it. And um, it was it was a lot of fun to wear. Another one um, 
was a red velveteen dress that I made to recreate um, a garment from a Bordoni portrait. It was a beautiful red velvet um, 16th century Florence um, garment and it had cartridge pleating and these lovely puff sleeves that, that came all the way down. Um, there wasn't a lot of decoration on it. It was um, it w in, in period it would have been you know red silk velvet but mine was red cotton velvet um, but it was probably the first garment that I I felt I got the patterning right um, that fit me well and um, it just was a lot of fun to wear. Uh, I think another garment that I made was my um, Arnagund um, outfit. Uh, Arnagund was a queen in uh, 6th century uh, Francia. Uh, she was a Merovingian queen and uh, I recreated, as best I could, uh, her burial garments. Um, I did not do the tablet weaving. I, instead, I did embroidery that mimicked the tablet weaving because the tablet weaving was um, about 100 cards, <laughs> 100 cards wide, and um, my tablet weaving skills were not there. And, but I could embroider a pattern that was very similar to that, so I trimmed the front of the caftan uh, with an embroidery band instead of a tablet weaving band. Again, you know, sort of that 10 foot rule. And I just love that outfit. And uh, I was able to find the, the right um, fabric. The fabric that was found in the grave was uh, a purple and red shot um, in the warp, the threads running the long ways was a silk and going in the, the weft or crossways um, was linen. And so I was actually able to find a silk linen shot fabric that worked for it. And then um, the garment has this cuff band that had couched gold threads down um, in a pattern of rosettes and bees. And bees are kind of my um, heraldic uh, animal. and. Uh, so that was a really fun garment to make, and I think that those three are my favorite garments that I've made. Um, let's see, next question is how do you incorporate uh, modern technology and tools into your historical sewing and practice? Well, I use a sewing machine, I use a modern steam iron, I use a serger, um, I use modern dyes and modern threads. Sometimes I use uh, modern fusible interfacing depending on what kind of garment I'm making. Um, so the only time I really do a lot of hand sewing is if I'm making a gift for someone or if you know I'm just trying to be um, super historical. But you know I'm I'm getting up there in age and uh, hand sewing is not as appealing as it used to be. So uh, Dusty asked, what are my top 10 books on about fashion history? So that's a kind of a tough one because it really depends on your, um, what your focus is. Uh, for, for me, for Merovingian, there is a number of books um, that are just kind of about generalized archeological finds um, that are super useful to me. Uh, for me, it's, I use a lot of uh, journal articles and scholarly articles and conversations with the researchers to do my research. But if you're looking at uh, later periods, there is a number of different books out there. Um, you know, if you're looking at, um, oh, let's say 1800s, then there are a number of books on um, patterning and on construction methods. Um, you have the patterns of fashion books. Highly recommend those if they cover your time period. Um, Janet Arnold started those books and um, 
they show you how to pattern various garments and there's you know they, they start about the 1500s and they go up in time and there's some of those that are uh, specifically on undergarments and some on overgarments so those I highly recommend um, the modern Tudor Taylor has a book out that's really fantastic um, there's woven into the earth if um, if the 14 1500s are, are more your thing um, and if you're looking at you know late Victorian early modern there's a lot of just generalized uh, textbooks and how to sew books out there that are super helpful so Kirsten asks have I ever tried beaded embroidery um, or repair repairing embroidery um, yeah I I love beaded embroidery I haven't done it in lordy lordy decades um, the last time I did in beaded embroidery it was for a, a ball gown that I did 20 years ago it's I really like it it's a lot of fun um, it, it takes a lot of time I made myself a frame out of out of oak um, that I could put wide fabric on I can put 36 inch wide fabric on um, so that I could do large pieces I did a really fun like uh, pirate vest um, back in the 90s with that but I haven't really done it for, forever um, Greetings. Hello, Anya. It's nice to see you online. Um, and welcome, Kirsten. Thank you for that question. So the next question I have, um, how do you ensure your historical garments fit well and are comfortable to wear? That's where doing a mock-up is really important. You know, especially if you're doing corsets or stays. Um, unless you are incredibly lucky and slightly magical, uh, you're not gonna get it right on the first time. Um, the first time doing a corset, you, you learn so much because fabric works differently when you're, when you're making a, a, a garment like a corset. Um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, trial and error, making that mock-up, um, looking at you know having someone come in and help sometimes it's it's helpful to have a second person who knows sewing to come in and check the fit of your garment because you know you're trying to pin and you're trying trying to get your measurements and you're contorting all around so having a second person um, is often helpful so Barbara asks where do I find historical embroidery designs so I'm going to point folks back to <laughs> Um, archive.org great place to start um, they have a large number of, of lace patterns embroidery patterns um, and then there is another website that I will put into um, uh, the, the description below I've mentioned it before in uh, previous videos but there this website it's an archive of, of different books um, and sometimes those links go back to archive.org so just recommend checking out there and then if you are looking for you know relatively modern sources for embroidery um, patterns you know look at um, ladies home journal from the time period that you're looking for a lot of women's journals or women's magazines at the time would have um, either sewing patterns or embroidery patterns or knitting patterns those kinds of things so look at old magazines from the time period you're interested in Amara says how do I set a budget for a project <laughs> oh, a budget <laughs> um, I guess you have to ask yourself what's the purpose of the garment is it for um, you know a one-time wear that um, you don't necessarily have to be super historically accurate for um, you know you can get away with less expensive fabric or is this um, you know a tailored jacket or a coat that you want to be able to wear for 30 to 40 years 
um, there it might be better to you know kind of expand the budget to as much as you can to buy the best fabric that you can uh, finding good quality fabric is getting harder and harder uh, mass manufacturing um, you know the, the cheapening of our textile supply uh, it is a real issue when we want to make garments that will last us 30 or 40 years um, or that can be handed down and repaired over time. I mean, one of the reasons why we do sewing is so that we don't, you know, have to purchase fast fashion that's only going to be wearable for, you know, a season or two. And I think that's one of the reasons why I sew is so that I have garments that will last. But going back to your, your budget issue, Amaras, is you know, you kind of have to take your own individual circumstance into account. You know, what what clothing budget do you have? And, and you kind of start from there. If you don't have a really big clothing budget, then you probably won't have a really big budget for your sewing projects. But there's a lot of different ways that you can get access to um, inexpensive, high quality fabrics. And one of the ways is, you know, through thrift stores, um, used clothing stores. Um, secondhand shops, tchotchke shops, charity shops. Uh, a lot of times you will find good quality fabric just being sold there. People, you know, cleaning out estates and will dump fabric into that system. Or if you find a garment that you like um, in a thrift store, but it doesn't fit, it's a little bit big or the fit's kind of wonky, you can always adjust that. Um, you know, tablecloths or bed sheets or bedding you know you know once you get the fabric itself cleaned up it makes lovely sewing fabric and there's lots of it and it's very inexpensive so there's a lot of ways that you can um, economize when it comes to your sewing budget but when I'm making something that you know I want to wear for a really long time and that's most of my clothes um, I, I don't make a lot of costumes anymore. Um, I don't participate in, you know, uh, the SCA as much as I used to. Uh, so I'm not making a lot of costumes um, anymore. Most of my sewing is because I want a modern garment to wear, but I want to incorporate historical aspects to it. So I try to just be very careful in my um, fabric purchases and purchase the best quality that I can and I look for sales because sales are always happening um, let's see so we're getting on to a half an hour so this is going to be my last question unless one comes up in chat um, how do you stay inspired and motivated to continue sewing historical garments um, and I'm going to put modern garments there too um, and that's you know that's kind of hard sometimes is, uh, you know, especially folks like, like me that have ADHD, um, you know, finishing projects and staying motivated with the project is I just have to keep reminding myself why I sew and why I wanted that garment in the first place. Um, I have a number of different garments that I have started and are in various um, stages and to go back to them, I just have to remind myself that I started this project because I wanted to sew that garment. And it's just important for me to um, finish it. Otherwise, you know, it'll just add to my punishment pile and sit there and, and uh, send nasty vibes my direction. I try to keep my punishment pile as small as possible. And if that means getting rid of failed projects, then I get rid of failed projects. I pass it on to someone else um, so that they can finish it. Excuse me, allergies. Um, so yeah, you know, staying inspired and motivated is just, you have to find your own key and your own trigger. And, and for me, it's just remembering that I want to wear that garment, um, that 17th century uh, jacket that I'm working on, uh, that I'm using um, Alabama Channon's uh, applique technique to do sort of a historically patterned and historically inspired um, jacket 
but I just think it's going to be so fun to wear, so I keep myself working on it. Uh, I have a ways to go, but there will be a video on it when I get done. So that was the last of my questions. Um, last call for questions in the chat. Hey, Lime Green. Um, uh, hope the weather over there in the Netherlands is uh, treating you right. We have another person from the Netherlands also online. Okay, I will continue to answer questions and comments over on the, the chat on the uh, YouTube video. So if something occurs to you later, um, feel free to drop a comment in there. Give it a thumbs up. Um, so Dusty asked if I have a list of resources. And yes, I've done a number of videos um, on finding... Uh, free resources for historical research online, uh, free resources for historical patterns. Um, so there's a number of videos that uh, have in the description different links. So you feel, feel free to watch those videos, check out those descriptions. Um, and if I'm missing anything, let me know. Sometimes I forget to update my descriptions with the links. Uh, ADHD brain. <laughs> So just let me know if I'm missing any links. And uh, Dusty, you know, that's a good point. I have been wanting to start a blog for forever. Um, and so I'm hoping that I will get to that this year. I have blog posts written. I just haven't gotten my website blog together yet. I should probably get off my hiney and do that. <laughs> so give me a thumbs up or comment below if you want to see me put this information into a blog. And so until next time. Have a good day and I bid you joy.